From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Brian Mullady. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Dominican Father Brian Milady is in the house. If you've got a question for Father, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-288. 3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is 1 205 271 2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1 205 271 2985. You can always send us an email, openline at ewtn.com. Or you can text your question. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Text your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams. Michael McCall producing the program. Your call screener is Mr. Charles Beery. And our host is he is every single Thursday. Father Brian Milady, how are you? Just peachy. Father Brian here. <laughs> yes, and, and, uh, and your frequent flyer miles continue to accrue. Where are you today? Uh, well, I'm in the same place. I'm still on vacation in Los Angeles. It ends tomorrow. So. <laughs> well, there you go. And then, back, there you go. And then uh-huh. back to the tropics in Portland, Oregon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Father, uh, t- well, before we go any further, I will say that we are also uh, available for you at YouTube, uh, EWTN's YouTube channel or Facebook page, EWTN Radio. And uh, if you're watching us there, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. Now, what is this business about the Mother of God assuming stuff? Oh, Mary assumed into heaven. Uh, I wanted to talk about the assumption this week because, for one thing, I celebrated a Mass on Sunday, and I was listening to the preacher, and he hardly mentioned the assumption for some reason, and it was the Feast of the Assumption. Uh the classic text for the assumption of Mary into heaven in uh, scripture is Revelation 12, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. And I see in that text, and I'm reading it more or less through the eyes of, uh, I think, philosophy and perhaps authentically what some of the intention was in the writer, the inspired writer, St. John, that all of nature has God as its final purpose. Only in order for this to be realized, it has to be realized in us. Because we're sort of the conduit by which all the things that come forth from God return to God. God is unity who creates in diversity, but the diversity of all the different things that exist seek to return to a unity in him. Now, because most of those things are material, God is spiritual, they can't, they can seek this by their actions, but they can't actually accomplish it. It has to be accomplished in man. And the reason is because we have a body and a soul, so we summarize all the things that go below us, and yet the dynamism of creation back toward unity can only be realized in us because we have a spiritual soul. However, as we all know, or should know, the resurrection of the body in which we uh, see what we're finally created to be and is demonstrated as very clearly in the ascension of Christ to the heaven physically is necessary for a human being, a human person. Of course, Christ wasn't a human person, but we are for a human person to enjoy the fullness of unity which the universe offers in its actions. Now, this is demonstrated in our Lord, who is a person, divine person, but by a special gift, because Christ's body came to us through Mary, and Mary is, of course, the first member of our church, 
not in the sense of a series, but in the sense of perfection, it's altogether fitting that it be perfected in her. And so the moon and the stars and all that represent all the different cosmic forces and powers that are seeking unity, but they only find unity, first of all, through Christ and God, but then as Mary as a human person, the woman clothed with the sun, is the one in whom they actually experience this because now she sees God in the face in heaven. She's the only one that does that, not only with her soul though, the saints do that, but also by a special gift with her body in a resurrected state. So her she being assumed into heaven demonstrates the fact that this is what the final purpose of our creation and the whole existence of the world is. That the creatures, the things made, the material beings might find their unity in us and we might find our unity in God. The oldest description of the assumption, which of course is 600 years after the our Lord lived on earth and Mary was assumed into heaven, is in St. John Damascene. And even though it's probably just a a story to demonstrate the truth It is very delightful because uh, it's related that the Blessed Virgin experienced the kind of death. Now, the death of Mary has never been defined if she experienced death or not uh, by the church. Pius XII, of course, defined the assumption. But she experienced, if she experienced death, she experienced a kind of death that was a non-corrupting death. So I used to say it's like Snow White, you know, who eats the poisoned apple, but her body is still fresh and warm, and she has this kind of living death sort of thing. The Eastern Church celebrates her death as the feast of her sleeping, the Dormition. Well, all the 12 apostles, according to Don John Damascene, were transported to Jerusalem to mourn over her. And when, uh, except for Thomas, who was late as usual, <laughs> And when he got there, he asked to see the body. So when they uncovered the tomb, they discovered it was empty. And so they assumed that Christ had given this special gift to Our Lady, that she would be taking body and soul into heaven right now to anticipate our own resurrection from the dead in the physical sense at the end of time. So this is a marvelous gift given to Mary, but not only is it a gift given to her, but it represents her dignity as a Christian And it also represents to us, or should appear as a sign to us, of the whole reason why God created the world and how nature is realized in grace and grace is realized in God. So the woman clothed the sun with the moon under her feet and the crown of 12 stars. This is such a beautiful, beautiful image of her. And as you know, uh, at the end of scripture in Revelation, you have the woman, the child, and then there's the dragon who torments the church on earth. Just as at the beginning of scripture in Genesis 3.15, you have the woman, the child, and the serpent. So like bookends, the uh, Christ, of course, is the cementing uh, mystery, but then you have Our Lady always present, and then you have the tormenting of the serpent or the dragon or Satan of the Christian community, and of course, before it was Adam and Eve, um, to keep this from happening. Well, no, we have surrendered ourselves with her. We're not seeking the egotism of Satan or to devour others. What we're seeking to do is to allow ourselves to prepare ourselves for our own uh, resurrection of the dead. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free telephone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. So, Father, just very briefly in the couple minutes we have left here, um, how would this differ from what we read about Elijah and Enoch? Well, Elijah and Enoch, whatever happened to them, they didn't experience a risen body. Uh, a resurrected body. Remember, the the bodily that we experience is like Christ's body, and it's very different because Christ's body was truly physical. I mean, he proved that by eating a piece of fish, but then it could also pass through walls. And the way this is normally put is 
that on this earth, the body comes to exist, the, the soul comes to exist after the manner of the body. That's why we know through the senses. But after death, when we're risen from the dead, our soul uh, body comes to exist after the manner of the soul. So as if the soul is fulfilled with light because you see God, according to 1 Corinthians, it's agile and um, full of light, etc. But if it's a soul that is not fulfilled in hell, the body reflects that, but it can't die again. Whereas Enoch and Elijah were actually uh, symbols, more or less. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, we've got a tremendous DVD bundle available for you at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Two very powerful DVDs that we were happy to present on uh, the television side of the network. A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing and then A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing to the Gender Agenda. In the original, uh, it examined how Saul Alinsky's words and famous work rules for radicals have influenced political tactics and theories, especially on issues concerning social justice. Uh, but you can discover how Saul Alinsky successfully pulled the wool over society's eyes as the experts in this docudrama unravel the lies and deceptions he spun and ultimately reveal him as a wolf in sheep's clothing. In The Gender Agenda, it's a powerful documentary which sheds light on the philosophical and historical causes that have led to the attack on marriage and family and the undermining of Christian civilization and re respect for God's laws. It identifies how socialists and communist ideologues rebranded themselves as liberals and progressives to push a leftist agenda. These wolf in sheep's clothing would reorder our traditional biblical understanding of nature, marriage, and family unless we expose them for what they are. Uh, great bundle available for you at EWTN's religious catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. First up today is Daniela. She is in Camario, California, watching us today on YouTube. Uh, Daniela, you are on with Father Brian Milady. Oh, hi, hi, Daniela. Father Brian. Hi. Um, hi. My question is, uh, why do uh, I uh, sometimes see people at Mass crying? I mean, that happens to me sometimes, but I try not to blink, and um, I uh, return the tears back in my eyes because I don't want to be like a, you know, like a little girl. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Well, uh, I would, I, I, if I'm not there and I'm not talking to them, they could be crying for many different reasons. However, what I would say is that it's not uncommon to have people so moved at Mass by the experience of the presence of our Lord and by the whole ritual and ceremonial and how beautiful it is, that they uh, cry. In other words, it demonstrates that they're spiritually moved by the beauty and depth and power of the mystery. I, I can't testify that that's why everybody cries at mass, but I certainly think that that's um, a common experience for some. And it's, it's beautiful. Also, they used to have what they called the gift of tears. And especially with priests, I believe St. Thomas experienced this, Aquinas, that when they were celebrating mass, they'd be so moved that the, they'd weep. It was a, a gift given by God. So that's that's the reason. So uh, priests always uh, enter and exit uh, last during Mass. Yes. Uh, I don't quite why understand. Do uh, why do they? Oh, because they represent Christ entering the synaxis or the assembly. And so once the congregation is assembled, then they represent Christ entering in 
And of course, the fullness of is performed in the action in the assembly, which the fancy liturgical scholars call the synaxis, when they, uh, through the calling down of the Holy Spirit in the apoclesis, which is when the priest places his hands over the gifts in the consecration, and then says the words of institution makes Christ present on the altar. And then they uh, they exit the assembly as Christ exiting the assembly. And they don't exit last, as you know. The congregation normally waits for them to leave. And then they leave because then Christ has departed. Thanks so much. We appreciate that phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Next up is Prudence in Pilot Point, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Um, Prudence, you're on with Father Brian Milady. Hi, Prudence. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, my question was I heard you uh, just a little bit ago say that we have a spiritual soul, where I have always understood that we have a, a body, soul, and inhabited by the Holy Spirit. So can you explain that a little bit more? Well, I think you're referring in St. Paul to the fact that he says body, soul, and spirit. But the spirit, the soul is not material. And the only other word you can use for that besides not material is spiritual. So our our soul is immortal. It never dies. It's a spirit. It's not the body. And the so-called use of the word spirit as a third member refers basically to the consecrated Christian who also receives the spiritual presence of the Holy Spirit in their souls through grace. But the general, um, I mean, this is in the catechism. It's not common philosophy that man is composed of a body and a soul, and the soul can't be material. It's not physical, so it's spiritual. So that's the way the reason the terminology is used. Is that cleared up? The reason that... It is, and I will say that one of the reasons that I say it is because after I received the Holy Eucharist, I feel so unworthy and just like pathetic and just so happy that um, that Jesus saved me like that. That's one of the reasons that I cry sometimes. <laughs> no, I didn't get the last part. You feel unworthy because Jesus... Yeah, it's just unworthy, and we're just so human and just kind of pathetic that he loves us for really no good reason except that he's good and so i just find it find that so well no he does love us for a good reason no 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 yeah he don't be too negative about this he does love us for a good reason because he wants us to be with him in heaven that's why he created the world i mean the whole plan of god would be frustrated if we couldn't be with him in heaven uh yes true we're sinners and but i I, we i would be careful about being too negative about that um we are also redeemed. So being redeemed, it means that we, uh, as the Council of Trent says, justification involves two things. The uh, forgiveness of sins, yes, because we are sinners, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior person. So you're uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't just love us for no reason whatsoever. That would be silly. He loves us because he wants us to be like him. So we can go to heaven, and he want, God wants to share His goodness because He's so. If that's true, I think. But you, that part is true because He's so good. But uh, he, he created us to be good, and He created Adam and Eve without sin. Remember, so that they could go to heaven. So I, I appreciate your. Um, what would you say your um, uh, realization that we don't deserve this? That's certainly true. Injustice. But I would not carry it so far as to say that we're just uh, miserable and he loves us for no reason. There's plenty of reason why he loves us. He wants us to be with him, and that's why he created the world. Next stop for us is Front Royal, Virginia. Zachary is in Virginia listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Zachary, you're on with Father Brian. Hey, Father Brian. Um, I guess I can keep it short, but I was just curious as to... (coughs) the Catholic Church's requirement on weekly attendance at Mass. Um, I understand it, uh, you know, completely separates us from God to not attend, and it's considered to be a mortal sin, but 
I haven't, there's, I don't know, there's been quite a few things I've looked at, but as a conversation with my teenage brother, I really wasn't able to give him an answer. Oh, my, my goodness. I think this is an easy question to answer, actually. Jesus himself, when he answered the Eucharist, said, do this in remembrance of me. The Ten Commandments recommend us on the Sabbath to keep holy the Sabbath. The doing in remembrance of Christ, of his sacrifice, because remember, the Eucharist only begins as a meal, the final sacrifice. Scott Hahn has an excellent book on this he wrote recently about the fourth cup, where the, the cups that are begun at the uh, Passover meal are only completed on the cross when Jesus says it's finished. So the do this in remembrance of me includes all these mysteries, including the resurrection. That's identified, Christ's worship of God is identified with our worship of God in the third commandment. And the third commandment is very serious, as you know, in the 10 commandments. So to uh, deny the necessity of worshiping God through the Eucharist, which is also a gift of love, on Sunday, because we've transferred the Sabbath to Sunday because of the resurrection, is a serious breach not only of God's law, but it's also a breach of our love that we should have for him. And also the idea, because remember, keep holy, there means to, you don't work like you normally do six days a week, because you're supposed to be thinking about God and how much he loves you in contemplation. So it belittles the whole necessity of human beings experiencing rest for the spirit and God once a week too. So there are all kinds of levels on which it demonstrates a disregard for the law of God, his truth, Christ's sacrifice, Christ's prayer. And then finally, I would say that if I said I loved a woman, but I never went to her house, pretty soon she doubt the fact that I loved her. Well, once a week for an hour, I mean, that's not too much to ask at all for you to ex experience thanksgiving and renewal when you consider how much Christ loved you to die on the cross. How's that, Zachary? That's good. Good. <laughs> all right. Lots of reasons for this. <laughs> yeah. Very much. Thanks, yeah. Zachary. We appreciate the phone call. That yes. frees up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. We're going to head quickly to Dave in Howell, Michigan, who's listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Dave, you're on with Father Brian. Hello, hello. Hey, Am I coming through? Hello, you're coming hello. through. Uh, thank, thank God for w John, EWTN. Uh, Father, I, want, I was hoping to ask uh, three questions, but if time limits only one, then so be it. That's fine. Um, my first one was, is I know the Pope is urging folks to take the, the vaccine, and I, my deepest question is, is, is that a matter of faith and morals? No. Okay, okay. The, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Um, the Pope, in his capacity as head of the Church, can certainly encourage us to do certain practical things like that. But there is, after all, when it comes to medical uh, difficulties, um, a, a, a certain right on the individual to choose what medical procedures they wish to do or not. Now, I think what he's trying to point out is that since COVID can be spread so easily, it would be a lack of charity not to take the vaccination. But and he certainly has a right to put the weight of his office behind encouraging people to receive the vaccine. But he can't require it as a, a matter of sin. No, it doesn't bind under faith and morals. No. Thanks, Dave. We appreciate that phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Mike in Waukegan, Illinois, listening on the EWTN app. Mike, you're on with Father Brian. Hey, Mike. Hello, How are you doing today? Good. Good. Well, I just... Um... 
have a kind of a, a problem with a, 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 a conflict, you know, with uh, the church's uh, uh, stance on on drinking and what the what maybe the the secular, if you will, scientific uh, uh, stance is. Um, now, um, uh, the late uh, great Saint Pope John Paul II. Um, uh, I'm quoting him. He said that uh, the moderate use of alcohol as a drink doesn't violate moral norms. Of course and not. Hence, and hence, only its abuse is to be condemned. But, That's right. Uh, well, I uh, a, uh, a uh, 21st century uh, Merck medical info manual s- states that small amounts of alcohol, that is about uh, two hundredths to eight hundredths percent blood alcohol content, can act as a stimulant, often making one of a person giddy and talkative, and perhaps even loud and violent. So, where, and, so where's your where's your question here, Mike? First of all, well, alcohol is a depressant, so that doesn't make sense anyway. But what's your question? Well, I'm just. That's this is what the uh, the question is. Uh, um, where where do you draw the line as to what would be a, a safe amount, I guess, of uh, to drink without uh, experiencing what that just said? Well, it goes on to say it says larger amounts start depressing brain function. Uh, well, look, uh, scripture is very clear about this. Paul asked Timothy to take some wine. It also says, and wine to strengthen the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine. Our Lord himself obviously drank wine because it was at the Last Supper. Uh, Alcohol generally is, the Catholic attitude is that (laughs) there's nothing wrong with having a drink, all right? Uh, Monks, as you know, make beer. They also make brandy. Uh... The point is that you can't make a hard and fast rule about this by kind of scientific analysis where you say 1.2 liter, let's say milliliters, is drunkenness and the other is not, or one is harmful and the other is not. Um, People aren't like that. Their bodies aren't like that. All of our bodies are different. I will tell you as someone who's lived in a Catholic society, namely Italy, uh, with uh, a lot of friars who are of especially Spain, Italy, and France, that uh, they take wine, especially um, rather liberally, especially at lunch. However, sometimes they cut it with water. They don't think there's anything wrong with that. And at other times, I will tell you in those societies, any kind of public drunkenness, uh, a person is shunned for not being manly. So they don't allow, even though they, they're people that were weaned on, on alcohol. I remember I once saw an Italian priest have a baby sit in his lap, and he took his finger and dipped it in the glass of wine and put it in the baby's mouth to wean on. And I had an experience in an Italian community of Dominicans. I, I don't drink much at all. I can't, really, because my temperament's rather different than some others. But um, uh, they wanted me to take, take some wine at lunch. And I said, no, no, I, I can't today. I can't today. So he just shrugged his shoulders. Like, I don't know who this person is, but anyway. So finally, one day, I felt like I'd like to just have some wine. So I said, I think I'll have some wine today. He goes, finally, finalmente, we make progress with this American. Like this. <laughs> uh, now, the Pope's position is the correct one morally. Moderate uses of alcohol are fine. You'll notice it even says moderate uses of tobacco, which means you're not addicted to it. But um, but any kind of addiction, of course, would be wrong. And if a person is addicted, then of course, see again, your body or your spiritual constitution has to do with what's harmful to you or isn't. Because uh, it's determined differently for different people, then you would never should never partake if you're addicted to it. But uh, anyway, that's the moral position. 
Thanks, Mike. We appreciate the call today. 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986. Next up is Donna in Nashville, Tennessee. She's a first-time caller listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Donna, you're on with Father Brian Mullady. Hello, Donna. Hi, Father Brian. Hello. I love your story about the wine, and finally you drank some. That was very humorous <laughs> and funny. Finalmente facciamo progresso, he said. We're making progress. <laughs> I never knew a priest yet that didn't like one glass of wine. But yeah. anyway, my question, is, my question is actually about euthanasia. My brother signed my 93-year-old mother into the skilled nursing part of her facility, and unbeknownst to the family, he is a dentist, he cut off all her flu and pneumonia vaccines, and she ended up with the flu and almost died in intensive care. She recovered, but then again, a year later, uh, he tried to dumb down her, her DNR, and he, he when she was dying, he took away any kind of support at all so that she could die quicker. Okay, so my local priest said that's euthanasia. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I do. Unfortunately, I do. Uh, the, a person may self, themselves may refuse aggressive treatments, especially if it's just prolonging the inevitable in their lives. But the only way they may do this is by what's called a durable power of attorney. In other words, we encourage people not to sign living wills because the only person who has a right to decide this is the patient. When you sign a living will, you give the doctor in the hospital a right to decide this. And who defines what's an aggressive foreign treatment? Who defines what's a necessary treatment? Um, also, uh, when you make a durable power of attorney, you pick a person you think knows your mind. And the understanding is that they will make their decision according to what they know your mind to be when it comes to extraordinary measures. So uh, it sounds to me like, I don't know the way you describe it, but your brother uh, was deciding for himself and wasn't even consulting your your relative about that. And that's not correct. It's, it's like in the old times, you know, back in the 30s, doctors considered themselves gods sometimes, as I'm sure you're aware. And uh, in Catholic hospitals, I knew one old surgical nurse who was a nun. And uh, when I knew her, she was 88 years old, but she had been a surgical nurse at this hospital for years in Reno, Nevada. And she said, oh, you should have been there back in the 30s, Father, especially with those births. I had to stay there and say, doctor, get your hands off those tubes. There'll be no tube tying in this hospital. And the reason is because if a doctor thought a person, a woman had too many children, he wouldn't even ask her. He'd just tie her tubes while he was in there. So she wouldn't be able to conceive. Now, it, it has to be a personal decision. It has to in involve extraordinary means. And uh, the only person who has a right to make that decision is the patient. Um, you know, I mean, assuming that the means really are extraordinary. And if the patient, if someone else has to make such a decision, the patient needs to know who would know their mind and choose that person. And we, above all, we encourage the, against the living will because we do not want the doctors and nurses making this decision because they'll have you dead to get the bed empty, you know. And so uh, that's that's the bait. I would say I would concur with that. Now, there might be a priest who disagrees about that because, you know, when it comes to these practical judgments and morals, well, there's a lot of factors that can take into consideration, and I don't really know the whole case. But that's what I would say. Does that help, Donna? I believe so, too. Yes, because my mom was a strong 93-year-old Catholic, and— I believe she she would not she always took those vaccines year after year. So I did feel like it was against her wishes to also. I would suggest for for listeners if you ever have a relative you're not too sure about doing your living will or whatever, 
any kind of legal affairs as far as checking you into the nursing home, that there should be two persons to observe the documentation so something right. doesn't happen that you're not in favor of. Especially if it's just the people in the home that are determining that. No. Uh, and, and they'll even say refuse food and water. You, you can't do that. I mean, uh, you can't make that a legal thing. And uh, so it has to be the patient themselves. And, and that's why the living will is too nebulous and negative and untrustworthy. It has to be a durable power. We all have to sign a durable power of attorney in the religious life. And we pick someone. Now, I pick my provincial superior. Other friars don't trust their provincial superior <laughs> that much. <laughs> so they pick their family members. But um, it, it has to be on the patient's uh, choice. Thank you, Donna. We appreciate the phone call. Next up is Thomas in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's listening on the EWTN app. Thomas, you're on with Father Brian. Hey, Father Brian. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I was making a comment to caller before last, too. It made me think of that Thomas Aquinas quote where it said, sorrow can be elevated by a good sleep, a, a bath, and a glass of wine. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, my question is, I, I saw the something about the unforgivable sin, and somebody, I've, I've talked to da Dr. David Anders about this, and he said it was final impenitence, but I've, I also saw the case for despair, and I was curious, what is the despair that is so great? It's not like a, just a feeling of horror, or is it well, do you, yeah, you, you want me to tell you about the unforgivable sin, or is that's not despair? Oh, yeah. what, 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 what constitutes what is that? Yes. Okay. It's a sin against the Holy Spirit, right? Right. And th this sin is not unforgivable in itself, but you can see examples in Scripture. Uh, th there, Thomas Aquinas actually says this: there is a sin against the Son and a sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Son is to question Jesus' human nature. So you remember that Jesus' relatives thought he was out of his mind. They actually said that at one point along the line. Um, this is sin against the Son because it doubts Christ's integrity in his, as man. But the sin against the Holy Spirit is the context is he casts out devils by means of devils, if you recall, because the only means we have for the forgiveness of sins is Christ's human nature. And so if we deny that Jesus uh, his human nature is holy and that he casts out demons uh, without himself being having demonic power, but actually divine power, then we close ourselves to the means by which we can experience the forgiveness of sins. So it's not that our sin is unforgivable. It's that we have denied the only means by which it can be forgiven. So the two examples are rather instructive and I actually, when I read St. Thomas's solution to this, I found it very interesting uh, and I think quite good, the distinction between the two. So the one denies Jesus' human nature, the other denies his divine nature. That's the unforgivable sin. Um, Is that cleared up, Thomas? It, it does. But say like somebody had, had said a bunch of bad stuff towards like that person of the Holy Trinity could they be forgiven in confession or, or no? Now, I, again, I didn't get the first part. Someone did what to the Holy Trinity? Like if someone spoke bad about that member of the Holy Trinity. Oh, they, could, could they, they be forgiven in confession? Well, if they're sorry, of course they could be forgiven. But if they're not sorry, <laughs> you have to be sorry, right? You have to have contrition. Um, but yeah, if they're sorry for doing so, of course they could be forgiven. Remember, all sins are forgivable in themselves. The issue with the unforgivable sin is that the person themselves has denied the means of forgiveness. So they'd be denying confession, for example, as a place where they could be forgiven. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Ken in Cincinnati, Ohio, listening on Sacred Heart Radio, a first-time caller. Ken, you are on with Father Brian. Hi, Ken. Okay. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to say I loved your uh, Christian social order 
I watched that two years ago. I DVR'd it, took copious notes. It was fantastic. I really oh, well, did you buy the book? <laughs> you uh, no, but I book. will. It's no, on but Amazon. It's on Amazon. Thank <laughs> okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Here's my question. I have a, yeah, I have a concern about about myself. I work up. Uh, I work every Sunday. I work retail furniture sales, and uh, oh, uh, I've been uh-huh. missing Sunday mass, and I've been going on Thursday morning. And I, and I know that's not the way the church teaches, and it's really a struggle with me internally. Um, you know, we're, I, I tried to do it for uh, for a while, and we have to work late Saturday. I'm, I'm on early Sunday until late Sunday. Um, is there any any disposition for that, or uh, do I just need to make a well, decision not to work uh, Sunday? Yeah. Well, uh, of course, now remember, if you miss Mass through your own fault, that's a sin. If you're forced to work by your employer and you couldn't work another day without being fired or something like that, then for your livelihood, you have to do that, right? It's a laudable custom to, um, you know, go to Mass another day to demonstrate your desire to worship God. And it's kind of accidental in a sense that you can't do it on Sunday. Hopefully, that will not be the case for your whole life, you know. Um, but if it's necessary for your employment and you're, anytime you could, it's hard to imagine not being able to access a Mass somewhere because they go on till. Well, we had in San Francisco, we have a candlelight mass at 9 p.m. on Sunday night <laughs> to get the last stragglers, so to speak. But it's hard to imagine you couldn't find one. But if you can't, then for the time you must work on Sunday, then it's it's not violating the commandment because it's not exactly through your own fault. If you could get another job or if you could ask your employer to allow you some time off, to attend church, or if you could ask him to change your working hours, then I would say you'd have some sort of obligation to do that. But if you can't, then, then, you know, you have to wait till you're able to again to return to Sunday worship. Mass and Sunday. Yeah, and I'll tell you something, Ken. I grew up in St. Louis, in St. Louis University, the Jesuit University in St. Louis. During the school year, always had a 10 p.m. Sunday Mass, just as Father's describing, for the very reasons that Father's describing. And if I were a betting man, I'd say Xavier University there in Cincinnati has probably got something similar. You might want to check that out. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. You know, Father Patrick Payton, who's uh, famous for the say uh, the phrase, the family that prays together stays together in the Rosary right. Campaign, also did some wonderful work with some of the leading people in Hollywood back in his day with radio dramas. And we bring you those every Sunday night, Family Radio Classic the- or Family Theater Classic Radio, uh, Sunday nights at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time, in Shining Armor, this week's offering, starring Roddy McDowell. Uh, Roddy McDowell is actually oh. a classically trained actor. Many people yes. only know him as Cornelius on the Planet of the Apes. But he's uh, he was actually a very talented actor, and you can hear him to, uh, this Sunday night, 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio. Next up is Cynthia. She is in Spring, Texas, listening on the EWTN app. Cynthia, you are on with Father Brian. Hi, Cynthia. Hello, Father Brian. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, my confession, I mean my confession, my question is about reconciliation. Um, I'm a senior citizen, and I've been uh, cradle Catholic and um, went all to Catholic school. And as I understand, com- um, the confession of mortal sin, of course, is is um, uh, imperative. And But I'm, I'm, I'm questioning if you had um, some kind of mortal sin in your youth, teenagers, whatever, uh, and you don't, as an adult, as, you know, I'm 74 now, if you are an adult and you kind of think that you, maybe you didn't just, and I don't, I didn't know if I could call this scrupulosity or not, because at the end of reconciliation, you say, I'm sorry for these sins and all the sins of my past life, but I was just concerned about anything that was mortal 
that in my immature faith and uh, fear in, as teenagers or college age kids, would th- would you be would you should you c- try to remember those things and re- you know re, re- uh, maybe just repeat them or think that if 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 you don't you're not going to be a re- repetition if you don't remember if you really confess uh, I, under- that, I right? understand your question yeah but uh, the basic answer to the way you phrase it is no you shouldn't go over and keep trying to remember past sins. If you sincerely try to examine your conscience and you weren't hiding something on purpose in confession, if you were hiding something on purpose, you'd have to, to, to confess that. But if you just forgot or you um, just didn't pay attention to it, um, then that's covered under the idea that uh, for these and all the sins you cannot remember, you're hardly sorry. However, the Council of Trent teaches that if you do remember a mortal sin, not because it hasn't been forgiven, but for the sake of the integrity of the confessional, and you know you haven't mentioned it in confession, that you should mention it. However, when this teaching is taught to priests in confessional practice, it's underlined that don't tell this to scrupulous people because they'll just go and find everything that existed in their lives. Now, There are examples of people, and especially one particular sin, and I only know this because of my experience. One sin I've had an interesting experience with is you'll have someone who's lived their whole life a devout Catholic, a woman who may be in her 80s or 90s. uh, She's been a good wife and mother, et cetera, and then you get called because the person's concerned about death or something. And the person begins to weep and they'll say something. And I, I will, well, I guess this usually. And I say, well, you had an abortion when you were young and you didn't ever mention it confession. Uh, I don't know why I did it, but I did it. And I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with it. Well, I'm glad they mentioned that confession before they die. All right. But uh, uh, for most things, uh, we're, we encourage people not to dredge up their past confessions. Now, I know there's a thing called a general confession. It's a very Jesuitical thing. Uh, Dominicans don't particularly like general, general confessions for this reason. But St. Ignatius and the Jesuits uh, have provision for it. But normally, my understanding of it is not being a Jesuit that it's supposed to be done like once or twice in your lifetime. And usually if you're converting, reconverting, or you're entering a vocation or something like that, uh, there are, I know, some spiritual uh, um, preachers today who tell people they should go to a general confession every six months. I think that's ridiculous. I'm sorry. I don't agree with that. And... um, so, unfortunately, your question is a simple one, but it has lots of distinctions connected to it, as do most human matters. But if it's just a matter of you trying to dredge up things in the past to be sure you did it, don't do it. If you happen to remember it, and it is a mortal sin, you have to put it under the integrity of the keys. And if you purposely suppressed it or you don't, you blotted it out of your consciousness and then you remember you did it, then it's a mortal sin. You should mention it also. Thanks, India. We've just got a couple seconds left here, Father. Uh, Mike in Wells, Minnesota, a first-time caller listening on Real Presence Radio, wanted to know if there were any writings that uh, tell us who was present when Mary was assumed. The only one, as I say, is John Damascene, who wrote 600 years later. He was one of the last of the Eastern Fathers. He was so late that I believe he was a, a finance minister to the uh, Muslim caliph of Damascus. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's just a description and it's probably something from tradition, but no, we don't know. Uh, so it's part of the mystery of it all. That's right. But, but it's defined doctrine by Pius XII, ex catheter defined. Yeah, very good. Father, thanks so much for being so gracious with your time. Would you leave us with a blessing? May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Brian Malady, our producer, Michael McCall, and our call screener, Charles Beery, I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Thursday. Back at it tomorrow, we'll have our very own Vice President of Theology, Mr. Colin Donovan, in the house. Unfettered access to a professional theologian tomorrow, talking theology on EWTN's Open Line Friday with Colin Donovan. Until we get together then, God bless.